Hello, my name is host Eric, and I am the host of Talking with Famous People. And we are here this evening with a group of famous people, including Hami INFP listener Jesse, that person, Omnia Ot Nahil, Kiwi Sauce, Trenton, <laughs> and Nandi. Omnia Ot Nahil, would you like to, if you have a microphone or a camera and you'd like to join in that capacity, unless you were a different name for somebody I've met before, I don't believe I have encountered you before. If you're just here to listen, that's fine too. Uh, we're currently talking the subject at hand, barring Omnia Ot Nihil's um, participation, is the topic of if an extroverted intuitor or an introverted intuitor. Okay, that's fine. Uh, I, I don't know what, exactly what that means, all or nothing. If it's all or nothing, I'll take all, but if you're not, I'm not sure if you're giving me a choice or not. Um, anyway, the, the point I'm trying to make is that, is it possible for an any dom or an NI dom to know what it feels like to go through life as, with their tool function, their second function, TI or TE, as a dominant function? So, one thing that prompts this thinking in general is that a lot of ENTPs, if they're first asked, if they first learn about the cognitive function model and they don't understand the way it entirely works, they're likely to consider themselves TI DOMs because, of course, ENTPs do a lot of fancy talk. We're thinkers. They don't, if, if somebody comes into the, the cognitive function model and they don't understand that your main tool function is, is in fact, what you're going to do most of your work in, then and with, then they're likely to misunderstand the nature of perceiving function and assume they're TI DOMs. The, the question then becomes, well, what? how could an ENTP know what it actually feels like, or is it possible for an ENTP to actually know what it feels like to be a TI DOM? Well, how would that differ in experience? And how would it differ in experience for an INTJ to be a TE DOM. Well, I have a couple of thoughts to begin the discussion. First, I would say a TI DOM is going to consistently prioritize possible ways in which new data interacts with their existing logic. And the ENTP is very familiar with that. So when I'm reading I think that's probably similar, or closer to anyway, the experience of a TI DOM. Uh, a lot of times when I'm reading, I used to be more like what I would consider an, an EDOM, which is I'm looking to uh, to fight when I'm reading. But more as I've gotten older, I, I tend to try to find pieces that I consider are useful to fit into uh, to fit into a set of logically consistent axioms and such. And so when I'm reading, I'm looking for that and I'm relating it back and forth within these internal models, the axioms, and I'm not really considering too much the utility of it necessarily, or nor am I considering it particularly things I can do with it, or or possible external uses, I'm more considering how it's interacting with my internal model. I don't know what it feels like to be a TI DOM, obviously, but I would imagine that I'm at least behaving more like a TI DOM um, when I am reading scholarly stuff and not feeling fighty and just trying to integrate it into my existing models than in any other moments. So, what are your thoughts regarding that, uh, Hami, uh, from the perspective of somebody who's got TE and NI instead? Uh, I don't think it's possible because, uh, as you said before, your first and second function work in tandem. So, even if you try to imagine how, for example, I would use T be a TE DOM, um, it would have to, I would have to imagine myself using TE first and then NI second. 
but I'm always using NI first, mm. even when I'm using TE. Okay, so do you think it's possible to imagine being an ES an ES T no wait an IS TJ what what's the thing if you if you had your one four reversed what type would you be uh ESFP ESFP okay could you imagine yourself being an ESFP but see you would oh yeah you would okay that's right Wait, no, you still have TE. You'd be an E as TP, right? No, yes, TP as TI. Oh, so you'd have to switch. You have to switch your TE and your FI around. So it would go, yeah, okay. It would be S E F I T E um, N I. So do you think it's yeah. more easy to imagine being an ESFP than it is to imagine being a uh, E and TJ? No. Okay. Like I can, I guess I, I can think or imagine how an ESFP acts, but I don't really I don't know how, how it feels to be an ESFP. Well, here's why I think I can guess what it would feel like to be an ISFJ. Is because I could imagine I know kind of what it's like to spend time in SI really clearly. Uh, I know when I'm going through an SI period, what I'm keeping track of in my head. I've got a clear model from my mom doing it my whole childhood. And I know what it feels The trouble will be, of course, I can sort of picture what it would feel like to be SI that much more and NE that much less. But I can't quite imagine what it would be like to have the middle two reversed so that you've got FE in the second and... Um, TI in the third. Okay, so it comes down to the question, are our models accurate? Well, I mean, I guess then it comes down to the question of how do you attribute the status of accuracy? If it's, if it's utility in understanding others, then it's definitely accurate enough to affect that utility. If it's, I mean, it depends. Yeah, what what are you gonna what metric we're we gonna use to afford the status of accurate to something? That's the question. I mean, I I find it incredibly accurate, and I find it uh, I find it intuitively sensible. I find it logically consistent, and a good representative model of what human experience tends to suggest. I don't find it arbitrary. I I think that there are good reasons, good logically consistent reasons why it makes sense that if you're on the the seesaw of playing and cleaning up, that to the extent that you play more, you clean up less and vice versa. I mean, it doesn't seem like it can really be in any dispute. But, I mean, I understand that the our, the words we use to talk about the fact that we prioritize certain uh, manners of attention upon the world are inexact, for sure. And they can provide only so much specificity only so much clarity on human behavior. It's a lot of variables to consider. But I nevertheless conclude that some things are clearly more right than others. And as one's understanding grows, one better understands why some things are more right than others. Um, there's, there's, I think that one thing it's worth talking about in this video a bit is this terrible mistake that people have, and especially INTPs are prone to this mistake, but I wouldn't be surprised if INTJs are equally prone to it, which is the notion that we need more empirical evidence to understand things with a certain degree of certainty. 
that until we see corresponding brain scans proving this, that we won't be fully satisfied that a model is accurate. However, this is a metaphysical model because we're dealing with something metaphysical, consciousness. There's no way that brain scans can accurately account for consciousness because consciousness can change itself in response to the fact that it knows it's being brain scanned. In, in a in a fully aware sapient being capable of very incisive metacognition the ability to reduce identity to physical architecture within the brain I think is limited however it doesn't mean that I'm not willing to accept physical evidence that would clearly falsify something if such evidence existed. It's hard for me to imagine how such evidence clearly would falsify something, but I'm willing to concede that it might, and I would be convinced by it if I saw it. Okay, other thoughts on the issue of what was the topic uh, going into this? I forget. Uh, it was about, um, can you imagine yourself um, oh, right, right, switching right. your auxiliary and your dominant? Okay, well, do you think it's plausible to imagine yourself switching your two and your three? So that, for you, can you imagine prioritizing more uh, the other introverted judging function and less the extroverted judging function? I mean, the introverted judging function, less the extroverted one. No, I can't. Okay. I feel I think that's harder. Like I can imagine myself using being an SE user more than being an auxiliary FR user. See, I think I can imagine reasonably well being an being an auxiliary FE user because it would simply mean paying more attention to how others are feeling in this moment and less to consistency logically about the ideas. No, I haven't. Yeah, I feel like I feel like your dominant and your uh, your fourth function, um, you have a, I feel like you have a better grasp of what it is than even your uh, auxiliary and your tertiary functions. Like you, like for example, me. I use N I, but I still know what S E is. It's just that I'm weak at it. Right. But I understand what it is, though. Right. Yeah. So I I agree. I think that that is easier to understand what it would be like to utilize your fourth a lot more frequently is a simple enough thing to understand. Well, I I I'm not saying they're not far away from you. But what I'm saying is, if I'm spending most of the day uh, doing jumping jacks, and then just a little bit of time during the day doing push-ups, I can at least imagine what it would be like to do to switch that around and do push-ups most of the day and jumping jacks just a little bit of the day. At least it makes sense conceptually as a possible option. Whereas, it's hard for us to imagine, instead of doing... Um, if, we, if all you do all day is jumping jacks, it's really difficult to imagine what it must be like for somebody who, who all day they spend scuba diving. You know, it's it's going to be a very different environment. You're going to you're going to assume things that aren't there, and you're going to fail to note things that are obvious. Somebody who uses that that medium all the time. And also, you have to remember that uh, your dominant and your uh, last function. They actually work on the same axis, so right. you you wouldn't be able to you wouldn't be able you wouldn't be able to use any without SI, and vice versa. Right. So yeah, exactly. It's the it's the coin analogy or the axis analogy, the seesaw thing, where that's why they're uh, inversely proportional is because they're on a single axis. They're opposite ends of a single axis, and to raise it above consciousness is to lower the other end of it. But uh, yeah, so I think I think that that's one way in which the quadrumates, the relationship between quadrumates and cisionics, 
is attained because of those reasons. It's that the ISFJ can fundamentally get the ENTP's frustrations because they can imagine themselves in the other position pretty easily. And the ENTP can easily get the ISFJ's frustrations because we we wish we were we wish we had that SI stuff going on. And if we did, we'd be very frustrated by us too. We'd get it, you know? We are already very frustrated by us. So uh, you know, it makes that's that's why I like the dual idea. I like it and I think it's it's accurate. And I'm going to I personally, maybe because it's I'm a TI DOM. I mean, a TI tool function user instead of, I mean, I guess it, maybe it's because I have TI T instead of, ahead of F. I plan to adhere to this. I plan to find for me uh, uh, the right ISFJ woman and or remain single. I don't plan on on finding a relationship that doesn't make sense according to this model. Some people might say, that's crazy, Eric, if you like somebody. Well, my point is, I'm looking for somebody that I don't just like, but that I fit with long term. And I understand human nature as, can we communicate on this point or not? If we can't, and we can't because of cognitive function blind spots, then there's nothing we're going to do to fix that problem. It's just, we're fundamentally different. Any other thoughts on this topic? Anybody? Yeah, I actually agree. Um, Cause like as an INTJ, I can. I don't think I would work well with any other type aside from an ESFP. Because um, I think if you, like some people say that uh, ENFPs match best with INTJs. But I, I think they fit better as friends rather than in a relationship because they don't you don't they don't use the same functions. I mean they use two of the same functions, but the other two functions are completely different. So you're saying about ENTJs and INTJs? No, I'm saying uh, INTJ and ENFP. Oh. Yeah. Well. JC says, that's crazy, Eric, if you like somebody. Well, I don't need to, uh, I don't need to, um, okay, Trenton is sending me a message, it's taking me time to read it, um, but regardless, uh, okay, so, JC, my answer to that would be I'm looking for somebody who's compatible on specific channels, right? So if I like somebody and I say, oh, this, this woman is a potential candidate for me, then um, I'm going to say, well, what are my criteria for uh, a mate? And I'm going to say I need her to check me in the following fashion if you're going to check me check me like this and if if she checks me in some other ways consistently or fails to check me then that's a problem it's not meeting my needs and then concurrently if uh, if she if she's ex I mean the thing is if she meets all these criteria, then whatever type she says she is, it doesn't really matter because she's behaving as though she were an ISFJ. Whether it's because the cognitive function model is right or just a really good way to taxonomy human behavior and describe different people who are um, exhibiting habits of behavior along these various mm, descriptive, descriptive lines, then either way, it doesn't matter which one it is. The fact is, I'm looking for somebody who fits with me along these particular lines of understanding. So I think that if I did like somebody and they were, say, an INFJ or 
you know, an e ESFJ like I had before, or I don't know what other types fit well with ENTPs like ESFP or INFJ. Uh, INFJ, supposedly. Yes. Suppo yeah, INFJs do. We we get along really well. Um, if if it were one of those other types, then I would just say, uh, okay, great. Well, let's 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 keep hanging out, and and we'd find out eventually that that there's there's core difficulties, there's core disagreements. If and if there's not, then there's not. Great. I mean, look, you know, I say things, but I, I'm very flexible. And also, if you're looking, I just feel like when you're looking for someone in a relationship, it's a, you should be looking for a partner that maximizes your weaknesses and vice versa. Say again? So I, I was saying that uh, when you're looking for, uh, no, uh, for looking for a partner, you should look for a partner that maximizes um, your weaknesses and vice versa. Well, I mean, I think that's... I think it's generally true, and that's the duels model, you know. But I also think that it's going to matter more, maybe, um, for some types than others. So I don't know. I I think that I think that not not only dual relationships can work, but I think that fundamental principle principle you just said is pretty sound, and it's hard to get around um, the fact that you want to have a significant other. Who's who shores up your fourth slot? You know, it's pretty hard to get around that. So relationships can be optimized, though, as shitty a way it is to think about it. So what do you mean by that? Omnia ot nihil can be optimized. Do you mean that um, you can note the areas of likely disagreement, sort of put up walls around? potential problem areas and prevent them from occurring or that you can com metacognate out of that or communicate out of that or that some of those might have less impact than others and you can structure life to make it less impactful because uh, I would I was thinking well look if I had somebody who wasn't that strong in SI but we were if we were rich or something then we could hire somebody to do that shit we could hire somebody to do the SI shit and it wouldn't really matter you know, but if if neither of us are pretty good at SI and we don't have the means to do that, then uh, it's a more important issue. You know, you gotta have somebody to do certain things. Everything is lost. Pretentious thick rib. Oh, <laughs> I know who you are. You're Lorenz Walker. Um. Yeah, that was an easy puzzle. Yeah, fairly easy puzzle. So that's my thoughts on that. Anyone else want to chime in on this topic? Okay, well, that brings us to a close today on this episode of Talking with Fitness People. The most exciting 23 minutes and 40 seconds of your entire life. 